inferior religions. To introduce my puppets and the wild body, the generic puppet of all, I must project the fanciful wandering figure to be the showman to whom the antics and solemn gambols of these wild children are to be the source of strange delight. In the first of these stories he makes his appearance, the fascinating imbecility of the creaking men machines that some little restaurant or fishing boat works was the original subject of these studies, though in fact the nautical set never materialized. The boat's tackle and dirty little shell, or the hotel and its technique of hospitality, keeping the limbs of men and women involved in a monotonous rhythm from morning till night, that was the occupational background, placed in Brittany or Spanish Galicia. A man is made drunk with his boat or restaurant as he is with the merry-go-round, only it is the stead. Everyday drunkenness of the normal real, not easy to detect. We can all see the ascendance of a carousel has on men, driving them to a set of narrow intoxication. The wheel at Karis Brook imposes a set of movements upon the donkey inside it, in drawing water from the well that it is easy to grasp. But in the case of a hotel or fishing boat, for instance, the complexity of the rhythmic scheme, it is so great it passes as open and untrammeled life. This subtle and wider mechanism merges for the spectator in the general variety of nature. Yet we have in most lives the spectacle of a pattern as circumscribed and complete as a theorem of Euclid. So these are essays in a new human mathematic, but they are, each of them, simple shapes, little monuments of logic. I should like to compile a book of 40 of these propositions, one deriving from and depending on the other. A few of the axioms for such a book are here laid down. These intricately moving bobbins are all subject to a set of objects or to one in particular. Botenkans is fascinated by one object, for instance, one at once another vitality. He bangs up against it wildly at regular intervals, blackens it, contemplates it, moves round it and dreams. He reverences it. It is his task to kill it. All such fascination is religious. The damp napkins of the innkeeper are altar cloths of its rough illusion, as Julie's bruises are markings upon an idol with the peasant, Mammon dominating the background. Zorbov and Mademoiselle Peronet struggle for a pension de famille. Zorbov is the Polish cuckoo of a stupid and ill-managed nest. These studies, or rather primitive people, are studies in savage worship and attraction. The innkeeper rolls between his tables ten million times in a realistic rhythm. He worships his soup, his damp napkins, the lump of procreative flesh probably associated with him in this task. Bratko trance circles around Julie with gestures a million times repeated. Zaborov camps against and encircles Mademoiselle Peronet and her lover Carl. Bestre is the eternal watchdog with an elaborate civilized ritual. Similarly, the Conrack is engaged in a death struggle with his public. All religion has a mechanism of the celestial bodies, has a dance. When we wish to renew our idols, or break up the rhythm of our nevite, the effort postulates a respect which is a summit of devoutness. I would present these puppets then as carefully selected specimens of religious fanaticism. With their attendant objects or fetishes, they live and have a regular food and vitality. They are not creations, but puppets. You can be as exterior to them and live their life as little, as a showman grasping from beneath and working about a polichinel. They are only shadows of energy, not living beings. Their mechanism is a logical structure, and they are nothing but that. Boswell's Johnson, Mr. Veneering, Malvolio, Bouvard, and Pécochet, the commissioner in Crime and Punishment, do not live. They are congealed and frozen into logic, and an exuberant hysterical truth. They transcend life and are complete ciphers, but they are monuments of dead imperfection. Their only significance is their egoism. So the great intuitive figures of creation live with the universal egoism of the poet. This realism is satire. Satire is the great heaven of ideas, where you meet the titans of red laughter. 
It is just below intuition and life charged with black illusion. When we say types of humanity, we mean violent individualities and nothing stereotyped. But Quixote, Falstaff, and Pecksniff attract, in our memory, a vivid following. All differences, energy, and category of humanity a relatively small group, and not the myriads suggested by a generalization. A comic type is a failure of considerable energy, an imitation and standardizing of self, suggesting the existence of a uniform humanity, creating, that is, a little host as like as nine pins instead of one synthetic and various ego. It is a laziness that is the habit world of our system of successful personality. It is often part of our organism to become a fetish. So Boswell's Johnson or Sir John Falstaff are minute and rich religions. That Johnson was sort of a god to his biographer, we readily see. But Falstaff as well is sort of an English god, like the rice-bellied gods of laughter in China. They are illusions hugged and lived in, little dead totems. Just as all gods are reposed for humanity, the big religions and immense refuge and rest, so are these little grotesque fetishes. For one reason for this is that, for the spectator or participator, it is a world within the world, full of order, even if violent. All these are forms of static art then. There is a great deal of divine Olympian sleep in English humor, and its delightful dreams. The most gigantic spasm of laughter is sculptural, isolated, and essentially simple. I will catalog the attributes of laughter. 1. Laughter is the wild body song of triumph. 2. Laughter is the climax in the tragedy of seeing, hearing, and smelling self-consciously. 3. Laughter is the hark of delight of a gregarious animal at the proximity of its kind. For laughter is an independent, tremendously important, and lurid emotion. 5. Laughter is a representative of tragedy when tragedy is away. 6. Laughter is the emotion of tragic delight. 7. Laughter is a female of tragedy. 8. Laughter is a strong, elastic fish caught in sticks, springing and flopping around until it dies. 9. Laughter is a sudden handshake of mystic violence and the anarchist. 10. Laughter is a mind sneezing. 11. Laughter is the one obvious commotion or inexpression dynamic. 12. Laughter does not progress. It is primitive, hard, and unchangeable. The wild body, I have said, triumphs in its laughter. What is the wild body? The wild body, as understood here, is that small, primitive, literally antediluvian vessel in which we set out on our adventures. Or regarded as a brain, it is rather a winged magic horse that transports us hither and thither, sometimes rushing as in the Chinese cosmogonies. Laughter is the brain's body snort of exaltation. It expresses its wild sensation of power and speed. It is all that remains physical in the flash of thought. It's friction, or it may be a defiance flung at the hurrying fates. The wild body is this supreme survival that is us. The stark apparatus with its set of mysterious spasms, the most profound of which is laughter. The chemistry of personality, subterranean in sort of cemetery, whose decompositions are our lives. Puffs up and frigid balls, soapy snowman, arctic carnival mass, which we can photograph and fix. Upwards from the surface of existence of a lurid and dynamic scum oozes and accumulates into the characters we see. The real and tenacious poisons and sharp forces of vitality do not socially transpire. Within five yards of another man's eyes, we are on a little crater, which, if erupted, would split up as would a cocoa tin of nitrogen. Some of these bombs are ill-made, or some erratic in their timing, but they are all potential little bombs. Capriciously, however, the froth forms of these darkly contrived machines twist and puff in the air in our legitimate and levered masquerade. You were the female of Estre or Bratko Trance, and beneath the counterpane with him, 
you would be just below the surface of life, in touch with a tragic organism. The first indications of the proximity of the real soul would be apparent. You would be for hours beside a filmy crocodile, conscious of it like a bone on an x-ray, and for minutes in the midst of a tragic wallowing. The soul lives in a cadaverous activity. Its dramatic corruption thumps us like a racing engine in the body of a car. The finest humor is the great play shapes blown up or given off by the tragic corpse of life underneath the world of the camera. This futile, grotesque, and sometimes pretty sprawn is what this book is snapped started by the imagination. Any master of humor is an essential artist. Even Dickens is no exception. For it is the character of uselessness and impersonality which is found in laughter, the anarchist emotion concerned in the comic habit of the mind, that makes a man an artist. So when he begins living on his laughter, even in spite of himself, a man becomes an artist. Laughter is that arch complexity that is really as simple as bread. In this objective play world corresponding to our social consciousness, as opposed to our solitude, no final issue is decided. You may blow away a man to bubbles with a redundant gust of laughter, but that is not a personality. It is an apparition of no importance. But so much correspondence it has with its original that, if the cadaveric travail beneath is vigorous and bitter, the dummy or mass will be of a more original grotesqueness. The opposing armies in the early days of Flanders stuck up dummy men on poles for their enemies to pot at, in a spirit of ferocious banter. It is only a shell of that description that is engaged in the sphere of laughter. In our rather drab revel, there is a certain category of spirit that is not quite inanimate, and yet not very funny. It consists of those who take, at the Clarksons situated at the opening of their lives, some conventional Puritan costume. This is intended to assure them a minimum of strain, of course, and so it is a capitulation. In order to evade life, we must have recourse to those uniforms, but such a choice leaves nothing but the white and eternal abstraction of the shadow of laughter. So the king of play is not a phantom corresponding to the sovereign face beneath the surface. The latter must always be reckoned on. It is a skeleton at the feast, potentially, with us. That soul or dominant corruption is so real that he cannot rise up and take part in man's festival as false stuff of unwieldy spume. If he comes at all, it must be as he is, the skeleton or bogey of veritable life, stuck over with corruptions and vice. As such, he could rely on certain success to steam. Nothing more. A scornful optimism with its confident onslaughts on our optimism will not make material existence appear for our energy. The gladiator is not a perpetual monument of triumphant health. Napoleon was harried with Elvis. Moments of vision are blurred rapidly, and the poet sinks into the rhetoric of the will. But life is invisible, and perfection is not in the waves or houses that the poet sees. To rationalize that appearance is not possible. Beauty is an icy douche of ease, and happiness something suggested perfect conditions for an organism. It remains suggestion. A stormy landscape, and a pigment consisting of a lake of hard yet florid waves delight in each brilliant scoop or ragged burst was John Constable's beauty. Leonardo's consisted in red rain on the shadowed side of heads, and heads of massive female aesthetics. Ucello accumulated pale parallels and delighted in cold architecture of distinct color. Corn found in the symmetrical gushing of water in waves like huge vegetable insects, traced and worked faintly on a golden pate, his business. Cezanne like cumbrous democratic slabs of life, slightly leaning, transfixed in vegetable intensity. Beauty is an immense predilection, a perfect conviction of the desirability of a certain thing, whatever that thing may be. It is a universe for one organism. To a man with long and consumptive fingers, a sturdy hand may be heaven. We can aim at no universality of form, for what we see is not the reality. Henri Fabre was in every way a superior being to a salon artist. 
and he knew of elegant grubs which he would prefer to the salon painter's nymphs. It is quite obvious, though, to fulfill the conditions of successful art that we should live in relatively small communities.